So thanks a lot to you and thanks to the uh, Center for Collective Learning uh, for the opportunity. It's great to be uh, on, on such a fantastic lineup. Uh, congratulations. I, I tried to put together here a bit of like some of the research that I've been doing for the last 10 years, but I always like to start uh, from the past. Right. So uh, I think when we think about civic technology, we need to understand that uh, what might seem a new thing, it's not as new as we uh, might have thought. Some of you might have seen this before. Um, this is actually the Napoleon, Napoleonic telegraph or uh, the Na Napoleonic semaphore, which was invented by the end of the 18th century, a bit 1780s or something like this. Uh, it was invented in France by the uh, brothers Shop. Uh, so it was uh, a sequence of towers, as you can see, there were many towers of this, and these arms would be relaying message uh, one to another. Depending on the position that these towers were, they would correspond to a letter. And was the first time, at least in modern civilizations, because that's a bit contested, that messages that men, uh, that humankind developed the technology that could travel faster than horses. So there was great excitement at the time with the invention of the telegraph. Nonetheless, by one of the great intellectuals of the time, Alexander Vandermond, who was a was a mathematician and many other things. And here's what he says about uh, the telegraph at the time, right? The invention of the telegraph is a new factor that Rousseau did not include in his calculations because Rousseau talked about the problem of scale and democracy. Right? So Vandermont continues. It can be used to speak great distances as fluently and as distantly as in a room. There is no reason why it would not be possible for all citizens of France to communicate their will within a rather short time in such a way that this communication might be considered simultaneous. Beyond this excitement, there was something interesting as well. It's because this code that you see here uh, was secret for defense purposes. And uh, at the time, the intellectuals that saw this as a potential for democracy, they say, they used to say, you need to open up the code to unlock the potential for democracy. So it wasn't only the first civic tech movement, but probably the first open source movement that you ever had at the same time. Unfortunately, the uh, Napoleonic Telegraph wasn't used for much more than war, uh, also for a few frauds with stock markets so that people would send messages, results of stock markets, and to announce uh, uh, the birth of the son of Napoleon and things like this, but it never lived up to its democratic uh, potential. Move forward to uh, the telephone, and there was a similar um, there was a similar excitement about the invention of the telephone and its potential for democracy. So there is this uh, article, uh, I think 1922, by F. A. Collins, uh, in which he talks about how the telephone would make a new Athenian democracy possible now that people can communicate uh, so fast. You had similar experiments and excitement with cable TV in the in the 80s, in which uh, citizen councils used some technologies to interact uh, with citizens. And here for our uh, French colleagues that might be attending this, they might remember this, the Minitel, one of the precursors of, of the web. And there were also experiments at the time on a e-democracy, electronic democracy, that would be called at the time. So the Projet Aspazi, the Projet Teletel, and the Interactive City Council in the city of Isilia Molino, which I was an intern in 2000. There was still a, a, a Minitel there. And that's actually how I got interested in the subject of digital democracy. So it all started uh, in Isilia Molino uh, when there were still things going on. Comes the internet, and there is uh, an equal excitement. Here's a fragment of a speech of Al Gore in 1994, which he talks about the GII, the Global Information Infrastructure, and he talks about the potential of it, and he ends up saying, it's always recurrent, the idea of Athens, uh, I see a new Athenian age of democracy forged at the forum that the Global Information Infrastructure will create. I mean, I don't think uh, we need to look uh, a little bit at some recent events that we saw in politics, some of them at least proposed, at least in part by technology for us to see that we're far somehow uh, from realizing that Athenian ideal that, uh, that we had 
uh, one French Belgium uh, sociologist. I mean, it's every time I listen to a, a nationality, but somebody who I really like, and he talks, uh, he has a great article called The Promise of Redemption, and he talks about technologies and democracy. He looks at these, these stories uh, of the past on technology and democracy, and he says, well, it's when you see the uh, ongoing excitement, it's a strange alchemy of cynicism, naivety, and amnesia. Right? This is not to say that technology hasn't changed politics, but I think for us to not be so cynical or naive or just to forget, I think it's extremely important that we bear this information background, right? And no better way of seeing this is learning from history, but also seeing what happens in uh, technology now in the present. So how is civic technology faring uh, nowadays? So what I'll present here is mostly uh, some research program that we started at the bank about eight years ago, and it's still ongoing uh, with, uh, with, uh, with a team um, uh, that, that works with me, uh, co-authors, actually the, the big researchers, the big quantitative guys and the good uh, in, in, in a full team, but Frederick Schoenberg and Jonathan Mellon. So I'm going to present a kind of like a very compressed version of what we've been finding uh, recently. Before a bit of like definitions uh, of what we're talking about, civic technologies, when I'm talking about civic technologies here, I'm talking about technologies that are purposefully designed to promote participation, which is hopefully inclusive, and to promote government's response as well on its turn that it's hopefully inclusive. I understand that there are other technologies that can become civic technologies like social media and you can leverage them for civic purposes. But I'm talking here about technologies that are designed for the intent of promoting participation and government response. Okay. So who participates in civic tech? One of the things that we often forget, it's a great part of the excitement around technologies for its democratic potential is that it reduces the transaction costs for people to participate, right? So instead of me having to attend a meeting at a certain time in a, um, in a certain moment of the day, I can now participate from virtually anywhere at whatever time I want. Of course, it's not just that, but that's one of the things. So participation made easier by technology and it brings people to participate. So a big question that uh, one, and that the field has been asking for a long time is, who participates, right? When we add technology to a process, which type of citizen are we bringing to the process? So um, participatory budgeting, I mean, I, I would assume that most of the people know, but participatory budgeting is a process where citizens can decide on a portion of the location of the budget. Um, in some places, they vote offline and online at the same time. This is the case of participatory budgeting in the state of Rio Grande do Sul which is the largest participatory budgeting in the world. And when we were working with them, there was a 5 million people participating yearly in the process. <clears throat> and we wanted to see uh, online voting. Once you added online voting to the process, which type of people or what was the strongest predictor of who the online voters would be, right? So uh, what we see when you compare online voters with offline voters, Here's what we find. Online voters, they are more likely to be users of social networks, which is not surprising, but they're also more likely to be male. They have higher income and they are more educated. If you think about participatory budgeting as a process which is supposed to be inclusive and, to, and sometimes have even a redistributive function, right? you can start to have maybe some doubts about this. What we see, however, and this, uh, I hope we can have a more uh, discussion, uh, is that combined with the offline process, you did have bigger diversity of participants uh, in which from a collective intelligence perspective, this bigger diversity should be producing better decisions. And you can talk later whether this is the case or not, because we also looked uh, at that. Now, continuating on who participates, when you look at this pattern, we looked in different contexts, we look, for example, in Uganda, uh, initiative called U-Report through mobile phones 
uh, which uh, youth is consulted on different issues that matters to them about school books, about uh, sexual education, about early marriage. And we wanted to see who participated as well. And uh, one of the things that we saw is that you also had strong biases in terms of gender, but also in terms of income and education and so on and so forth. One can say, well, but maybe that's Brazil. Maybe that's only places where you have low connectivity. We looked as well at in the UK, one of the most famous websites, so early websites of, of, of civic participation, and you see that female participation is still lower. That's actually a pattern that we've been finding of a certain pattern of exclusion, which in their majority, there are their exceptions, tends to be mostly male, more educated, higher income, and higher education. Now, there are exceptions. So, for example, we looked at 3.9 million uh, signatures uh, from uh, change.org data across over 100 countries. <clears throat> and we found that women participated more on change.org by signing petitions online. And also, if you compare with offline participation, uh, you'd see more men participated offline uh, in traditional petitions. So, change.org did manage to bring more women uh, to the process than men. But of course, when you look at participation and who participates, there are different types of participation. In the field of participatory democracy, there's a famous distinction that we do between thin participation and thick participation. Uh, a good example of thin participation, it's the, so thin participation is the participation that doesn't require lots of effort from you, which is maybe liking something on Facebook or sharing a petition online or signing a petition. An example of thick participation is a participation that demands more time from you. It is either creating a petition or having to attend in person to a meeting. Now, when you looked on change.org uh, about uh, thin and thick participation, then a different pattern emerges. Women create more petitions, women sign more petitions, but men create more petitions, right? So there more, you have more men creating petitions and more women signing petitions, which would raise the question, maybe worrisome, uh, you might have more women participation but maybe men are the gatekeepers or dictating what is the agenda that is being carried out. I'm going to go back to that later. Now, let's forget about citizens participating, who participates. I mean, once citizens participate, do governments respond? Because that's an important thing. Most of these tools, they're trying to elicit a sort of change in the public sphere that in most of the times aim to change uh, decision-making, public decision-making. So when citizens participate, do governments respond? Together with Jonathan Fox, a while ago, we tried to do a, a study looking at different initiatives, different civic tech initiatives around the world and try to see if when citizens participate, could they offer it? Could you find evidence that they changed something, that it made a difference, that government responded? We, at the time, we found only 25 cases, which sounds uh, very small, but you'd be surprised to find out how very few civic tech initiatives actually declare afterwards, once you ask for input for, for citizens, what has been the impact of it. Okay, so what we found looking at overall of these initiatives is that while civic tech platforms seem to be relevant, to increase the capacity to respond. So you can find out more, it makes it easier for you to respond. Most of these platforms have yet to influence their willingness to do so. So in a nutshell, it's saying that civic tech worked great in most of the cases, there are exceptions. They worked great, but only when government was already willing to be responsive. Now, when governments respond, who do they respond to? This becomes the next question. So citizens participate, governments respond. Now, who does the government respond to? So we took some data from uh, Fix My Street 
in which citizens essentially they send reports uh, to the government and those governments are, uh, so there's a pothole in my street, there's graffiti, uh, the lights are not functioning. So lots of problems about urban problems. And Fix My Street covers all the local governments in the UK. So you need to bear in mind that this is not just one local government. This is the data about responsiveness of all the local governments. So what we did is that we looked at about 400,000 reports. Uh, we controlled for which type of complaint was done. So we control for that. And we tried to see what was the strongest predictor to have that problem fixed or not because the data set shows you as well if, if the problem got fixed or not. So the strongest predictors for responsiveness, controlling for other factors, first of all, is whether you said please on your report, which is not very surprising here in the UK. So saying please and being polite might work, uh, might go long ways. Um, adding a picture also increased the responsiveness uh, of, of your report. Your report became most likely to be fixed. But here's the sad part. If you sign your name as a male, even for the same type of report, it's the strongest predictor effect to have your issue fixed. And again, this is not just one local government in the UK. This is all the local governments in the UK that we're looking at. So looking at this, it's what a bit we call, uh, we call the, uh, the polite male with a camera effect, because if you if you say please and you are a man and you take a picture of it, it's much more likely for you to get an answer than uh, than anybody else, which is quite uh, concerning if you're thinking about civic technologies platforms that should be strengthening democracy and strengthening interaction with governments, and you have uh, sometimes these uh, type of results. Having said this, it's not always bad news. So we were just talking about change.org. When you look at change.org, uh, mobilization is the strongest predictor of success, which is not surprising. So here, what you have illustrating for you is the number of signature and the likelihood of success of a petition, the likelihood of government responding to that. It's not surprising. The more signatures a petition has, the more likely it will be to be successful. And what is interesting is that we found out that women mobilize more signatures than men. So women are much better than men to mobilize signatures. And it's also important, you know why? In terms of some people say, well, does it matter who's participating, men or women? Yes, it does, because they have different agendas. For example, you could see by looking at change.org that men and women, they have different policy preferences or, or uh, policy priorities. So given that mobilization is the strongest predictor of success and women mobilize more signatures than men, you have the results that the Washington Post summarized for us wonderfully, which is women create fewer online petitions than men, but they're more successful. In fact, women created petitions are 1.4 times as likely to be successful as male created petitions. I'm not gonna get into the details of that, but I think it's important for, for example, when you look at participatory budgeting or fix my street and change.org, you see total different patterns in terms of response of who participates, but also in responsiveness. And many times they're not as intuitive as we would think, which leads to something that we hate, hope we can discuss in a little bit, is that institutional design really matters. And the way you design your civic tech opening that black box it is something extremely important. Yes. Which is the not so glamorous part of civic tech. It's not about big data, it's not about, it's about designing participation, but these things, they have a huge impact. Which brings me to the issue of future, which are the agendas of the future. I think institutional design is one of them for civic tech, but also others. I mean, uh, Cesar hit on the nail with uh, the last, uh, the last seminar, I know there's been discussion about this, but you know the choice architecture matters. Uh, choice architecture, meaning how how options or how options or how choices are presented to citizens and the choices that they make about it. Just to give a very clear uh, a very clear example of the impact of choice architecture, for example, 
No, there's a big amount of uh, participatory platforms, for example, in which they review the preferences of other users. So for example, by showing which are the most popular options. Uh, there is good empirical evidence from some cases, right? Uh, but also theoretical, evidence, theoretical considerations to make us believe that, for example, when you disclose preferences of others, in certain cases, it might not be a good idea. I'm not saying it's always a bad idea, but in some cases, it might not be a good idea. But there is, I would say there's enough evidence to show that if you go, for example, for a crowdsourcing effort, so to speak, in which in one, you show most popular right away, or another one in which you do not show what people's choices were done previously, that might have an impact, both in terms of inclusiveness, in terms of uh, elite capture or like organized mobs capturing something, and also in terms of collective intelligence or uh, optimality of results towards the public good. Second thing, and I think this is one that we don't talk a lot, it is about understanding responsiveness, right? Uh, how, what makes government respond? I like always to tell this story, it's about, this is about a uh, Russian region, which uh, it was full, the, the situation of the roads were so bad that some citizens and graffiti artists started to paint uh, the picture, the face of the governor in the potholes, right? Uh, of course, there was large coverage in the media, government wasn't very happy, and the government acted very quickly to solve the problem, and they solved it that way. Um, I mean, this, of course, is not a good case of government responsiveness, but it's a good case about nudging governments to act, right? What makes governments tick? Let's go again to fix my screen, right? I report a problem and it goes to the government and the government fixes it. We know government, some of them gets fixed, others don't. Now we had three hypotheses why this might be, might be the case, right? First, the government might be taking action based on their access to distributed information. The government is just like, it's a responsive government, they are learning it and they are fixing it. The second hypothesis is that governments taking action due to the naming and shaming effect. Uh, it is, well, it's public, it's there, it's reported. I don't want to like people seeing that it's not fixed for a month, so guys go and fix it. Or the third hypothesis is that a bit of each, right? Governments take uh, action for both of these reasons. Until nowadays, on these platforms, and that's one of the fascinating things, we really, really, really don't know what is the driving of government response behind that, right? What makes government respond? Let's suppose that governments respond 80% of the cases, not because of the access to distributed information, because probably they know and they have cars going around, but actually it's because it's public. It's the name in a shaming effect. And if we knew that for a fact, if we could observe that scientifically, right, that would change entirely the way you would be designing a tool like Fix My Street, for example. You'd start to make a ranking, most responsive, least responsive government. And you'd start to make press releases. You'd start to grow the naming and shaming effect. But maybe governments don't care about naming and shaming effect, and maybe it's about information. So you'd be designing your civic tech, or Fix My Street tool, uh, trying to improve the quality of information that is provided to governments so that it could be acting uh, better. So essentially what I'm saying is if we're thinking of civic tech, we need to think about the way that governments tick and how we can make governments more responsive. And it's what I call nudging the nudgers, right? Lots of behavioral uh, science has gone into understanding citizens' behavior, including in democracy. Get out the vote in elections. We have lots of experiments on that. Uh, on participatory democracy, we have we have now experiments on civility. There are lots of experiments. While I still think behavioral experiments on online participation are still extremely necessary for us to improve towards civility, inclusiveness, informed decision making. But there's one part that I think it's what I call reversed nudges or nudging the nudges. Can we start to think about behavioral interventions to make 
government more responsive, right? Let's nudge the nudges. Let's make them more responsive. And how would that happen? There is good research in the field of elite behavior that tries to look at this. It starts to look at this, but in the field of civic tech, this is still extremely limited. And I think one of the areas to be looking at. Now, I'm going to finalize here on some predictions. So uh, recently with uh, Tom Steinberg, uh, we uh, interviewed um, a dozen, uh, no, dozens of experts on, on technology, citizen participation, CESAR was one of them, in which you try to make predictions on the effects of technology on citizen engagement moving forward. Right? So how technologies, ongoing technologies and emerging technologies might affect citizen participation in the future. We make 11 predictions, which you can find them there, but um, I like to put three predictions here that I think it might be important as well for the research agenda if you're thinking about civic technologies or technologies and democracy at large. So here's one of the predictions. Government and politicians will increasingly use data about citizens to decide how important it is to respond to their requests and demands. Now, we all know, uh, or in most countries, we are the, uh, the issue of uh, financial credits, right? So um, credits, they have been used by, institution, by, by financial institutions for a long time, right? In the beginning of very limited data, but nowadays they start to use more and more data that it's a bit coming from everywhere and they, and they mine a wealth of data to come up with your credit score. Now, if you think governments as well, traditionally, they have used information that they dispose about some certain people to see if that person is worth being responded or not. So for example, politicians, they're more likely to pick up the phone of a call of a campaign funder than uh, an ordinary citizen. They're more likely to maybe pick up the phone of somebody who is in their constituency that they know that the person is extremely loud and will post everything on Facebook. So that is a problem, citizen. So governments traditionally they have had they have used cues of information to decide who which citizen is more worthy of a response than others. Now, with the amount of data that grows available about citizens, will government resist leveraging that data? to be more responsive or less responsive to citizens. Right? I mean, there is the China social credit system, which I'm not saying that it's one that it's about, I'm not going into responsiveness or democratic values here. And I, it's, it's such a so generous case that I don't want to enter into it, but I want to give an example about leveraging data about citizens and giving them access to some things. So for example, China social credit system, uh, even, Currently, uh, there's even some evidence about giving access preference to hospitals or to airlines or issues like this, but it's, it is leveraging data to give access. So as data become widely available and governments hold lots of data about us, will they start to be using that data more in the future? So here's an example, using data about people to leverage who's more worthy of a response or not is Facebook constituency badge system. So Facebook constituency badge system, I think it's uh, available in the, United, in the United States. I don't know if it's available elsewhere. Um, if I live in the district of my elected, uh, of, of my member of parliament, of my congressman, I can earn a badge so that when I talk to that member of parliament, of member of Congress, he knows that I live in, in his area. I'm a voter in that area, right? If I contact somebody in another area, I don't have that badge. So I am less worthy of his, him listening to me than others. So here the idea is you already leveraging very simple data to differentiate which citizens are more worthy of voice or not. Of course, this can go both ways. Huh? You can be thinking about uh, leveraging data so that the citizens that were historically marginalized, for example, they would have more voice in certain issues. Again, a matter of institutional design, but I think it's important for us to be thinking about this. Finally, a last one, and then I will conclude. Automation will drive a reduction in certain types of feedback from citizens to government. So again, fix my street. Great, citizens go there and does the reporting. But hey, 
You don't need to be reporting potholes, for example, if you have street bump on your phone. You just have street bump on your phone and as you're driving your car and there are bumps, your phone will be recording the bumps. You can have cameras capture. So the idea here is that traditional feedback that you often collected from citizens on these kind of things, they will become unnecessary. What's the impact of that for democracy? Particularly for political science for a long time, these were these types of like engagement, like reporting a pothole, they are considered an, a gateway for citizen participation and broader participation. As this feedback disappears, what will happen? Will citizens become more disengaged or maybe will release their time to engage more with policy and politics and not just with politics? You can go even further, or not myself, I mean, Caesar's, uh, <laughs> Caesar's uh, proposal, right? Of why not have like your clean representatives based on your, uh, based on your preferences that could be, uh, could, and, and here I'm, I'm, I'm doing a, an oversimplification, but that could replace or act as secondary representatives for you, right? So to, to, to policy making. Again, what does this mean, right? For democracy and, to, and, and uh, when does agency stops existing and you can start delegating it to automations. This can be good, this can be bad, uh, but it's things that we should be looking at because, for example, the, what, what, what Cesar puts forward might seem like a bit crazy, but meet Mishihito Matsuda in Japan, local government election, ran on the platform, it was an AI robot, ran on the platform that AI will change Tama City which is a small uh, area uh, in Tokyo, got voted third in the elections, right? I mean, some people might not be ready for it, but there are lots of people that might be starting to be ready for it. So what are the implications of that? How are we gonna be thinking in automation? As automation becomes more and more, and as we are extremely predictable in our preferences, what does that mean moving forward? And which way do we want to go? Final, and this is the final prediction, actually, it's uh, if augmented reality glasses become truly widespread, they can become a driver of increased citizen awareness around local issues. Okay? So behind every public space that you are, there is a certain level of public decision that was done. This was created by the uh, now uh, by the Sunlight Foundation during the uh, recovery in the United States, in which citizens could see where the recovery funds were going and seeing this. Of course, it was a was a, a phone application, not very used. But what happens if, like, imagine that augmented reality becomes really pervasive, and if people are using glasses, and you're going to start to be seen decisions much easier. You're going to be able to see this park cost X thousand or this street was made a, a walking street because of the decisions of X, Y, and Z, but ABC voted against. So you could bring the decisions, you could give visibility of decisions being done in the public space much more visible. But here again, there will be issues of choice architecture, right? How do you present the data for citizens in the future? I mean, if you, if you get into a situation in which you have really augmented reality and the people start to use it, forget the regulation about content of social media. All of this will pay or compare it to how do you regulate what people see on augmented reality, right? To whom belongs that space that is a mix of public space and a technological space. Okay? And how will be what presents to citizens, what is presented to citizens, how will that affect the way that we engage, they act collectively, and they engage with governments. So uh, that's all there are to say, uh, hoping that we avoid a fate similar like that one of the Napoleonic Telegraph. I think that these conversations are very useful. So thank you again, Cesar, uh, for promoting that. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Tiago. It was it was really marvelous. You know, I, I think you took us through history and and also, uh, you know, into the future with very provocative questions. Extremely well structured presentation. Five stars. You know, <laughs> so I before I I open the floor uh, to the audience, 
you know, I have like some comments and some questions on my own. Like on, on the one hand, I think it's true that there's a lot of efforts to reform democracy based on ideas of technology that have failed. And there is one example in history where technology did change governance very strongly. To me, that example is the printing press, because the printing press is a strong precursor of the changes from, you know, monarchies to democracies in Europe and, you know, eventually, you know, in the Americas as well. You know, so I think there have been situations in which communication technologies have affected, you know, the way in which people organize ourselves collectively. And, and printing, I think, is the most successful example of that, since a lot of the activism that was a precursor to the revolutions of the, you know, 18th and 19th century, you know, were actually started by bulletins, by publications, you know, it was, it was kind of like that ability to, to now communicate at, uh, at scale, you know, that change, you know, uh, from the Middle Ages through the Renaissance and then, you know, to the modern era. I, I wanted to just also include a question about the demographics. You, you share a lot of data about participation across gender, a little bit across, you know, income and other dimensions. You know, uh, and participation is clearly unbalanced, but uh, there's two things there. One is, you know, what's the benchmark of comparison? For instance, you know, if you look at people that participate online compared to the population, there's gonna be a bias, but if you compare to people that participate on a rally on the streets, you know, that also tend not to be a group that is very uh, diverse in many ways, you know, like, like, like the people that are from the capital were also, you know, mostly male or people that participate on a, on a, on a BLM uh, march or rally might be much younger, you know, or they might be politically homogeneous. So when we start looking at demographics, there are some obvious demographic dimensions like, you know, gender and age, but then we kind of start splitting uh, into other dimensions. For instance, you know, is the group that is participating politically diverse are people from the left and the right? You know, because it could be diverse, you know, in gender and age, but they could be all politically very homogeneous. So at, at which point, you know, we start kind of like, like, like thinking of uh, these efforts, also efforts that, you know, they, they elicit certain forms of participation and we need to learn to live, you know, with this not being a statistics, you know, but being, you know, politics, which at the end is who shows up to vote, you know. So that's kind of like my question, where do we stop? you know, in that demographic balancing. The way that I try to approach technology uh, is the way that Gramsci uh, <laughs> used to say is like uh, um, with the skepticism of the intellect and the optimism of the will. I think that's the way that I try to approach uh, uh, technology. So very optimistic, but having the intellect asking questions about this. On the, on the demographics, so I was just presenting at the, um, the uh, kind of like distortive uh, side, and that's, and you may, and, and actually your, your criticism, it is the criticism that we make to criticisms, critics of participatory democracy. To give an example, people say, well, but uh, you still have more men in participatory budgeting in Porto Alegre, for instance, than women. But then you say, well, but look at the city council how many women are there on the city council, right? The distribution is, is so, so you can always have your benchmark against an ideal and a benchmark against the status quo, right? And I think the way of your benchmarking is against the status quo. And if you're coming with participatory democracy, your status quo shouldn't be the general population, should be the, uh, I would say, like representative democracy institutions. And on that case, most of the time, participatory democracy or even technology, a led civic technology will be, will fare better. But you wanna be trying to get those things, particularly you wanna be trying to get a picture of diversity as a proxy of the cognitive diversity of that group, right? So the idea here is like, what is the, to which extent are we trying to get a maximum of cognitive diversity. Because of course you can have like a racial equality, you can have gender equality, but uh, and, and, uh, income, you can have like representatives in terms of gender and race, but if everybody went to Princeton, the cognitive diversity there won't be huge, right? And so uh, I think it is more as a proxy. Where do you stop? It's very difficult. Where do you stop? But you need to start with some that it's easy and that gives you comparable data. 
Right? I mean, for example, I would like to be collecting data much more about political activism. So actually we did do this. And now here's the good news in the case of, of participatory budgeting. Uh, for example, in Porto Alegre, we found more male, more educated uh, and wealthier. We got this profile, but when we asked them about being politically engaged or not, there were people who are traditionally politically disengaged. So anyway, even if they're wealthier or whatever, you're bringing people who before were not in the process, number one. And if you combine online with offline, the cognitive diversity of the group was much better. So here, what, we, what comes from us in the overall picture when you compare, when you look online participation and offline participation in that case, it is you want both because this is the one that brings you more diversity of participants. 